I'm going to start with a stanza from Etel Adnan's book, The Arab Apocalypse, from 1989. In the dark irritation of the eyes, there is a snake hiding. In the exhalations of Americans, there is a crumbling empire. In the foul waters of the rivers, there are Palestinians. Out, out of its borders, pain has a leash on its neck. Out, out of time, there's spring's shattered hope. In the deluge on our plains, there are no rains but stones. Thank you so much, Azad and Kashif and the 87 Press um, for supporting this project. Um, which has been in the making for quite some time. I thought I would introduce the book a little bit, um, uh, sort of just to explain my practice a bit so you understand where the book comes from. Um, so as Azad said, my work really centers around language, but language as a material that exists across different mediums and materials. And I'm very interested in how text can be visualized and translated into performance, into sound, um, into dance, into costume, into sculptural objects. Um, and I'm really intrigued by the question um, of how the body can become a publishing platform and how we can be choreographed by language. And throughout my practice, I really want to make space for listening and for the uncertain, the, the provisional, the fragmented, and also often confusing space of expression uh, as a site where we might want to resist the need to be clear and sure and programmatic um, and kind of lean into, yeah, the, the, the ambivalence or the confusion. Um, and I work a lot with an expanded understanding of translation uh, beyond translation between languages. And this is also the piece I'm going to present today. Um, so thinking about translation as a movement across materials and, and mediums. And um, so it's a short lecture performance that used to be a video essay that was commissioned during the pandemic and it made its way into the book. And I think it's a great fit for a book that's very interested in these different forms of transfer and transformation and, um, and, and copying. And the word decal uh, is, is a shortened version of the French décalcomanie, um, which comes from décalcaire to, to transfer um, a tracing. It's a form of tracing, uh, leaving an imprint. And um, some of you might know this, this practice, um, maybe you did that as a child, um, decalcomania, when you maybe put some um, paint onto a sheet of paper or glass or canvas and you rub the two sides together and um, they leave an imprint, like kind of butterfly shape. Um, so I'm very interested in these forms, um, these various practices of, of tactile um, but also imprecise copying with unpredictable outcomes. So for me, the decal is both a real process of making new work out of existing material, but also the type of lesson that I want from art. And so that's sort of as a, as a that should function as a kind of preface to the, the short, very short uh, lecture performance I'm gonna share. The curtain goes up on the beginning of Sunday it is as if it was ordinary weather. I have long been fascinated by a citational use of theater's conventions without enacting them. I hold open my book with a slab of clay to copy a passage about the history of scaffolding. Experimental translations make their scaffolding visible to intentionally upset the truism of translational invisibility, the scaffold visualizes a material process. This making visible does not aim for a transparency of meaning. Experimental translations side with a certain cloudiness. Lisa Robertson, poetry's soft architect, says, the weather is a stretchy, elaborate, delicate trapeze, an abstract and intact conveyance. 
The weather allows for small talk in a foreign language. It gives us a rich vocabulary for affective states, for speculative observations. I have tampered with the minimalist excavations of writing, but I lack the unflappability for such an assured disposition. I have a soft spot for the geometric drama of ornate artifice. Sometimes a student writes, history teaches us, or the scholarly literature agrees, and sometimes I let it go, and sometimes I lecture them gently, but secretly envy their innocence to make clear propositional statements. In an embrace of clouding the issue, I will speak near experimental translation today, in proximity to it and intimacy with it, rather than purely about it. The Vietnamese-born filmmaker, writer and academic Trinti Minh Ha explains her concept of speaking nearby. A speaking that does not objectify, does not point to an object as if it is distant from the speaking subject or absent from the speaking place. A speaking that reflects on itself and can come very close to the subject without, however, seizing or claiming it. A speaking in brief whose closures are only moments of transition opening up to other possible moments of transition. These are forms of indirectness well understood by anyone in tune with poetic language. Every element constructed in a film refers to the world around it, while having at the same time a life of its own. To speak nearby is not just a technique or a statement to be made verbally. It is an attitude in life, a way of positioning oneself in relation to the world. Thus, the challenge is to materialize it in all aspects of the film, verbally, musically, visually. More precisely, I want to think near the tactility of translation, its harboring of touch, its receptivity to other materials, what it picks up along the way. When I think of language as material, let's say as viscous, gooey, slushy matter, I think of Mina Loy's mucous membrane and trickle of saliva. I think of the abundant sensual furnishings of Lisa Robertson's poetry and prose. I think of Sarah Ahmed, who reminds us that the word furnish is related to the word perform and thus relates to the very question of how things appear. Queer becomes a matter of how things appear, how they gather how they perform to create the edges of spaces and worlds. In writing, we feel the words edges, listen for worlds. My dog smacks his lips, stretches, yawns, asking me to enter his soporific salivary language. The haptic disrupts the prominence of vision as a metaphor for distant knowing, as well as the distance of critique but it also calls for ethical questioning. What is caring touch in this context? Maria Pooch de la Bella Casa. I think of poets and queer theorists because that's the lived, read, written experience I bring to bear on my thinking about translation across different media. Translation as my scaffold, where the thinking of the building is on display. Besides, I always think about how things are made. What from the process is discarded to serve the finished product, if it is ever finished? How do you cement the process into the work so it becomes integral to it? When I was a child, I had a ruler that allowed me to trace all kinds of shapes, hexagons, ellipses, triangles and circles in different sizes. A plastic drawing aid, a geometric template for a collection of lines. I don't recall if this drawing aid was ever used in school, was just for playing, but it taught me about the ease of the decal, the power of the proxy. Is a translation always the retracing of shapes already carved, of thoughts already voiced, now tasked with a different sort of materialization on a variable scale of proximity? When I don't know how to continue, I do one of two things. One, I open a dictionary or look up the etymology of a word. It's changing uses over time, it's possible synonyms. This keeps me busy for a while. 
Two, I surround myself with books, with language as an ambient field floating in front of my eyes. For Annie Albers, quote, material, that is to say, unformed or unshaped matter, seems well fitted to become the training ground for invention and free speculation. The crafts, understood as conventions of treating material, introduce traditions of operation which embody set laws. This may be helpful in one direction as a frame for work, but these rules may also evoke a challenge. They are revocable, for they are set by man. They may provoke us to test ourselves against them. Everything I've written or made over the last year somehow leads me to Alba's chapter on tactile sensibility. I keep quoting it. It gives me guidance. Quote, Concrete substances and also colors per se, words, tones, volumes, space, motion, these constitute raw material. And here we still have to add that to which our sense of touch responds, the surface quality of matter and its consistency and structure. The very fact that terms for these tactile experiences are missing is significant. She asks us to pay attention to the surface appearance of material, such as grain, roughness or smoothness, dullness or gloss, or the inner structure of a material or object, its pliability, sponginess, brittleness, porousness. The wire bends easily, so we can shape it into any type of tree we want. The sort changed by constant wind, the weeping willow, the tree with branches that go up in all directions, the one we want. But materiality is not just gentle, obedient, mannerly. Material can be toxic, it can pinch, itch, it can ooze, it can go haywire. To move and hold material is a translational act. It's a playful gesture. The late artist Ellie Thomas called for an integration of the senses through which the work is continually restructured, continually within process, which allows us to play with the life of the work. As a translator, you play with the life of the work. And like all play, all experiment, you're caked in uncertainty. Oliana Wolf, the translingual poet and essayist I've most frequently translated, compares poetry to a game of hide and seek with its hot and cold fumbling in language. Maybe translation is a matching game, a bit like rummy, where a meld can either be a set, also known as a book, or a run, so it's less about accuracy and more about the conceptual similarity. A translation always exists in relation to another text. A non-translation is also always in a relationship with other texts, but can more easily be in denial. It can hide its process of dialogue. It can pretend to believe in the fantasy of matchless authorship. Perhaps it's for that reason of undeniability, of blatant relationality, that translations aren't pretentious. They are like the little magazines in which they usually first appear a modest genre, a minor literature. Oliana Wolf talks about Theresa Hakyung Cha deliberately constructing a minority language with which the author interrogates cultural and aesthetic belonging and the political implications of listening. A translator, as a good reader, listener, writer, can highlight or dispel passages that have to do with power, with difference, with intimacy, aligning themselves with the work or bringing it into a different political and material context. Playing with language can also mean resistance. Don Mi Choi's Hardly War uses translingual puns to attempt what she calls a new anti-colonial vocabulary of wound. Sometimes we use language to interrogate certain ways of looking at objects and beings and ways of being in our bodies or for our bodies to be with others. We learn to care for the hidden, the small the insignificant, the demoted, the despised, the marginalized, the non-normative, things that don't fit, explode the template. For Uliana Wolf, 
both experimental erasure poems and translations are about paying attention to what will disappear. In this way, they are connected to memory, to visibility, to care. Translation in its intention to preserve, to prevent disappearance, commits that disappearing act. If translation is always residually monolingual and authorial in the way it sets hierarchies and directions, it also froths the edges and is inevitably humbly subsidiary. I mean this as a compliment. In a recent interview in the Capilano Review, the dancer Dana Michelle speaks about her process. When I'm doing research, I'm cloaked in an invisible Velcro suit or a magnet suit. I'm in constant osmosis mode. I'm soaking everything up like a goddamn Christmas fruitcake. I'm touching materials, talking, thinking, getting super swollen with all the information. I was most interested in how a body reacted in the time of performance after having worn this soaked fruitcake suit. Translation as this fruitcake suit. Latasha N. Nevada digs, quote, I try on multiple languages like ribbons to better understand the gaps in my lineage and those histories indirectly related to me, unquote. Anne Carson brings translation into not explicitly translational projects. Stax, a 2008 collaboration with choreographer Jonah Bokea and sculptor Peter Cole, sees performers dance with cardboard boxes. They stack, restack, balance them on their heads, move them, kick them over, let them fall, let them tumble, drag them. At one point, the cardboard boxes also constitute the podium behind which Carson stands and from which she recites her poem. The process the dancers enact is translational, and translation in turn is a form of stacking. The stacks provide at times a headrest, at other times they weigh the body down, become unmonumental sculptures or toys to be tossed around, or occasions for gymnastics, for a duet, for what Oliana Wolf in my translation would call a dabbling double, a twin language. Sawako Nakayasu, another translator and writer, brings ants into the translation laboratory and onto the stage. In her performance, Insect Country, where the ants are co-performers, Nakayasu asks what it means to be under the tutelage of insects and to have ant affinity. She explains in an interview, quote, I think that everything is connected by translation and by a larger feeling of translation as movement and difference and reiteration and new avenues towards thinking about articulation. I could point to or talk about any single one of my books through the lens of translation. The ant book just as well is a translation. It's just that in that book, everything is being translated through ants, but something is moving from one place to another. Usually when we translate, when we talk about literary translation, we're moving through one language to another. The wall that it passes is this linguistic difference. But that wall that it passes can be anything. It can be performative. It can be thematic or material or temporal. That's really interesting as a way to think about just being in the world." Unquote. When I teach experimental writing or translation, I ask students to read John Keane's essay, Translating Poetry, Translating Blackness, getting them to think about how translation needs to be energized by the vital work in critical race studies, queer studies, disability studies, by small press publishing, work that teaches us how to destabilize what we know and how we've come to know it. But I also ask students to spend time with Keane's emotional outreach project which consists of simple scores, reminiscent of Fluxus pieces, which are activated by readers. One of Keane's prompts I give to students is to write out a beautiful line of poetry and leave it in public spaces. Today, I picked Yoko Ono's cloud piece. Imagine the clouds dripping. Dig a hole in your garden to put them in. An ordinary scene an element of chance, a moment of transition, a simple playfulness spun into philosophy, into forms of connection, an attitude in life, 
subtle translation of the everyday. Thank you.